Welcome, everybody, those of you who are here. Um, we have Zhu here, who is a PhD student at Auckland University. And I please join me in making him feel welcome. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, my name is Xiyang. So this, is to this talk is about a, a, a paper we published about two years ago on the ATC, and which is a, also a follow work uh, after the, uh, another paper we published, the ISCA. And the two years ago, I also gave the ISCA talk and uh, uh, Linux LCA 2016 and So, And two years ago, I mentioned that I was going to finish my thesis soon and going to graduate. And now I'm still a PhD student. So but it's part time now. <laughs> so, OK, yeah. So i start. If you look those a uh, top website, if, if you look those servers, a, a lot of uh, workload are latency critical. Or for example, the search or anything in your, for example, the radio or some real time workload where the latency is very important. Uh, and for servers, especially uh, for those uh, big companies like Google and Microsoft, uh, uh, they have published some reports say if you get a, a 400 millisecond delay and then you it, it dec decrease search user by 0.59%. And for Google, and uh, how, uh, the percentage you discreet is pretty much match their, how much money they got. Right? So this is important you make sure the latency uh, uh, match, your, match what you want. So, and uh, if you look at those data centers and uh, who back up those search, and their utilization is pretty low. And there is a reason behind that one. It's because if you push your data center utilization is too high, and you very hard to control the latency. Right? So from their report, see, the normal utilization is between 10% and 50%. Uh, here example uh, to show that why, to show the relationship between the CPU utilization and the tail latency. And most of the vendors, they care about tail latency, which means that uh, they care about the latencies who are slowest, uh, in the slowest group or slowest percentage, right? The average latency is not so interesting for those guys. And uh, uh, here is one, I use one benchmark, it's called Loose, it's a very popular open source search engine. And uh, it's used by Elasticsearch or Solo or uh, all the other open source uh, search framework. So uh, if you look at this graph, it shows that, OK, if I care about the percentile latency and uh, what's the relationship between the RPS, which is how busy the system requests per second, and uh, why is the latency. If you look at the 50 percentile latency, guys, uh, uh, the, the latency is going to be exponentially increased uh, very, uh, when, you, uh, when your system becoming busy. And if you care. As you care much about your tail latency, which means that you care about a 95% tail latency or the 99% tail latency, the curve is going to be changed, right? If you look at the 99% tail latency, you are very, in your early stage, you're going to go to that turning point. That after that turning point, everything uh, increases expansionally, and uh, it's also very hard to control those outliers. And uh, uh, so if your system say, okay, I care about well, I have an objection requirement that I want all my a latency less than uh, 100 millisecond, or at least my 99 percentile latency is less than uh, 100 millisecond. And same time, if we have the same graph, if you look at the utilization, normally here that goes to your utilization is 67 uh, percent, no SMT. So uh, if you look at those servers, uh, if you, sorry, if you look at those big companies like Facebook or Google, all of, the, all of them turn off their SMT. Uh, in Intel core, it's hyper-threading. So everybody turn off their hyper-threading. Because if you turn on your hyper-threading, even though you get a double the hardware, uh, double the hardware contact, but the performance may be affected significantly. So they turn them off. Uh, so if you count the SMT as two, uh, if you look at each core, actually, there's two hardware contacts, right? If you count, if you count each SMT as a CPU uh, contact, and then the utilization is way lower, right? And uh, people just waste resource. And uh, they, waste, they waste resource because they don't want to take risk. Uh, and now is that, uh, but the data center take a huge amount of money and uh, burn a huge amount of energy, right? And uh, Anything you do better here to utilize those powers is going to be safe, 
uh, a lot of money, can uh, save a lot of energy. Uh, here we go. So one idea, uh, if you look at those vendors again, normally they mix the computations between, they have some, like their search website is uh, latency critical, but same time they, they have some batch workload, which is they try to grab all the websites from whole world and try to index them. And for those are batch workload. And there's no latency requirement for the batch workload. And same thing happened, I think, for personal uh, computing devices. A, a, for example, your browser is more like a latency critical workload. At the same time, you may run some other background, uh, like DRAM compression, all those stuff are more like batch workload. Right? So uh, the current approach is that they turn off SMT first, and then they, some, uh, uh, I think most vendors, they just like do not mix uh, interactive workload together with a batch. They run them separate cluster, but some, some ones run them together. When they run them together, they very carefully that uh, they, relieve, uh, they, they reserve enough resource uh, for the latency critical workload, right? When something, when the batch is here, they make sure there's always one, some resource are idle, and uh, if the uh, latency critical workload becoming too busy, and then they kick the batch out and make the uh, results idle. Okay, so, and if you look uh, the way that from SMT perspective is actually the first one is that they do not use uh, half of SMT, so right, they only use half of them. Uh, and the second one is that some core are totally idle, right? This is very common for data center. Uh, what we want here is that we want latency, quick latency workload work nicely together with the batch workload in the same core turn on the SMT and make sure that the batch workload does not ruin the latency critical workload. This is what we want, right? And how, whether we can get that one or not is a, uh, is a research question. So uh, why, we can, why you cannot just directly put the loosen together on one SMT and Hadoop on another one and make them run nicely? Here's a one example. Uh, so uh, there are two graphs here. The top graph, uh, the Y show that's a 99 percentile latency, and uh, uh, X is also show uh, that's a request uh, per second. That's the workload you get. And uh, you can see that the latency is increased a little bit. So what is the, now the question is that now we, we have a, like for example, if our system has a requirement, say, oh my 99 percentile latency should be lower than 100 millisecond, right? And if that's the case, what has happened if we put a very simple program uh, to your paired SMT, right? And uh, this program can be simple as this one. It's just like a well loop uh, there, right? So, and if you measure the instructions per cycle, uh, normally this program, the instruction per cycle is uh, one, it's because it has a lot of jump. Uh, okay, uh, here's, uh, uh, sorry. Here, here's what it happened if you put them together, right? Your latency, your utilization is great because your paired SMT thread is always busy, right? And uh, uh, so you increase, per, you increase your utilization per, by 100%. And, uh, uh, but your latency is becoming so bad, right? It's because that the co-running guy occupy the microactor resource right, and make your performance is way slower. And uh, if you know, if you look the queuing theory, so if your computation power drops and your system getting busy and your tail latency can, gonna be increased exponentially but not linearly, right? That's why that, uh, 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 which is why that after some point, your performance is going pretty bad. Okay, so what has happened if I make the code runner very slow in terms of, uh, sorry, no, I make my code runner consume much less microarchitecture resource, right? So I have a microarchitecture uh, micro benchmark, which is called a, a MONTI instruction. That instruction is going to be bypass the catch, directly write a data to the DRAM, and then call it MFANS, waiting for this instruction to be finished. Uh, because the DRAM is far away, so this micro benchmarks uh, instruction per cycle is, uh, is going to be 10 cycles per instruction. 
So uh, we hope that if we make our co-runner uh, behavior like this, whether we can make it better. But the result is that it makes the latency a little bit better compared with the first co-runner, but still uh, the latency get affected significantly. And uh, remember, those vendors very, uh, those, if you look at those uh, data center or those companies, they're very uh, conservative. So any, they don't want to risk, uh, they don't want to uh, put the risk there that I run a batch that increase the uh, tail latency uh, by you know, uh, only a tiny bit, right? So uh, here we go. So let's look at why this happened. Why you put the co-runner there, you get, your performance gets affected a lot. So if you look at the, uh, this is a, a show the stage of a CPU pipeline. So the bottom is a, a time for single core, and the inside single core normally you get two, uh, for the Intel one you get two SMT threads, for the power one you get eight, uh, for the other machines you get different SMT threads. So uh, on the top there are breakdown of the microarchitecture resource for the CPU, for that core. For example, the first stage is ECU logic, and you have to issue your, your instruction. The second one is low store queue, which is also a very critical, uh, important resource. And third one is a function unit, like add, uh, subtract, and all those computation function unit. Right? So when you have a one single, when, you, when your core has only one single SMT active, you turn off the SMT, another SMT thread. So this single uh, SMT, a uh, Land SM, this uh, single SMT thread going to be occupy. It's able to occupy all the resources, even though in reality that you never be able to push all the resources busy. So some resources are always idle, right? That is also the motivation of why people introduce SMT because after if you have more uh, hardware threads share the same core, you hope that they can uh, uh, make this. They can utilize those microarchitecture resources nicely, right? And here it's less looks like. Uh, uh, what has happened if your two lands are active? And uh, if you look at those critical resources, uh, many resources are partitioned, either statically partitioned, like the low store queue. You divide, for example, I have a 10 low store queue in my core. If two SMT threads, each one get five, static, statistically. Right, statically. And, uh, but, the wrong, but the easy logic normally is shared between them round robin. So each thread got a slot to issue instructions. If you do not use that one, and then the another one can use. Only the function unit is really dynamic shared by all the uh, threads, right? So uh, when you issue the instruction, um, they have to do one by one, and uh, uh, the only thing is that uh, they can share the function unit, right? So uh, if you look the, if you look the, a timeline view, when those two SMT threads are active and both time, they kind of like share the critical resource. Even though one of them IPC is very low, right? But because the CPU doesn't know that, CPU just like stati statically partition the resource for you. Right, so here we go. So that's why it's becoming slow. And uh, here's what we want to do is that uh, if you look those a latency critical workload, especially search, or the browser, or the maybe some video and video uh, applications. Uh, their behavior is that they always not always busy, right? They all their utilization is uh, as I, we explained the first page. Their for the search, their utilization normally thirty percent, ten percent, twenty percent. So which means they can busy for a short period and then follow the idle period. And especially for search or some database transactions, uh, and uh, because they always handle this request trans transaction by transaction. So after you get a search request, you finish this search request, you go to a idle state, wait for a while for the next uh, search request. So oh, it will be good if we can control, uh, make a scheduler to control that the batch a uh, the batch SMT thread or the batch LAN is able to run when the latency critical LAN, when the latency critical SMT thread is in idle state, right? And uh, batch borrow the hardware. Uh, so we grab a core because in each in the Intel each core has two SMT threads. We reserve one thread for the 
a latency critical workload and another thread for all the batch workload, right? And we want the batch workload here, the batch workloads also means the batch SMT thread to borrow the hardware when the latency critical is idle and but release that when it's fun, that busy, right? Can we implement this one, the current hardware or not? So, and uh, actually it's hardware is ready, it's just the software is the problem here. Uh, so I did, because for example, we have now the latency critical is idle, the batch uh, jump to run here and the jump figure out, okay, the latency critical is busy. Now I should sleep. I just release my hardware to OS, say, okay, I'm going to sleep. Uh, and the hardware is going to be scheduled the idle thread here, right? And the idle thread is going to be called mWait. So mWait is a, a critical instruction here because this instruction um, allow you to release your microarchitecture resource, which means that if you have two SMT thread, when one SMT thread called mWait, the, uh, the, magic, the CPU core magically know that, okay, you're going to sleep. Now I'm going to shuffle all of those static partitioned resource back from the, your active thread to the another active thread. So which means that any, every time you call mWait, uh, your partner, the other SMT thread get all of the CPU resource. So and this timing, if you call, if the batch call mWait, the microarchitecture resource, resource of the latency critical land won't be affected. So the, when the latency critical jump to run there, he will, the latency critical workload will be able to occupy all the resource. But the problem is that the OS does not know, know that. What you tell OS is that I'm going to sleep, and OS is going to be figure out any uh, ready batch job, uh, keep going there, right? And um, but this is what you, as, as we showed before, when these two threads run together, the performance of latency critical get affected significantly. So, and this is not happy, right? And here's the semantic problem because the OS support, when you, the OS provide abstraction, it's called a thread or the contact. And when you tell kernel say, I want to uh, sleep, I want to release, it means that I release my software contact, the concept OS created for you, right? But in this case, what you really want is that I want to go to uh, sleep, hardware sleep, uh, uh, right? I, don't wa I still want my uh, software contacts here, but I do not want my hardware microarchitecture resource. So I want to tell kernel, say, hey kernel, I want to release, I want to call that instruction stay there forever. Or until or until the latency critical becoming idle and then come back. So and then we in the paper we provide a a, a special uh, system call and it's called a nanonap. A nanonap means that when you invoke a nanonap, you just like you just go to the kernel. You I do not want to release my contact, but I want to release my SMT uh, hardware resource and. Uh, uh, so the OS can do whatever you, whatever you want. You still, all the accept is accepted, all the interrupt is accepted. It's just like I don't want to release my a, a resource. It's like I dive in the kernel and hold my breath, right? So, and here uh, it's quite uh, simple. Uh, so, uh, and you just like enter the kernel, disable permission, and, uh, but, uh, and call the MV there until it wait on the my nap flag until some guy magically touch that memory location, then you're gonna be wake up from your nano nap sleep. Okay, so here is a performance uh, about how many cycles. Here's a, a measurement show that uh, how many cycles you can um, enter that deep sleep state and wake up deep, from a deep sleep state. Deep sleep here means that how long from you call a, from you make this system call to uh, the state that the CPU release all the resource uh, to the active thread. And uh, how we measure that one is a, we, we, we use our profiler, uh, we use our profiler which I give talk on the LCA 2016. So how we do that is that we set up, so we set up two counters and one counter count for what has happened for myself 
and then another counter count for what has happened for the uh, uh, for the whole call, and then you all, then you have another thread who just like call sleep or call and wait, right? And then and from the observer perspective, you can observe how many cycles the guy who call and wait released the resource back to you because you know that when the your, when, when that thread entered the deep sleep state, the two counters you measured are going to be the same. The two counter means what it happened for, my, for the whole call and what happened for myself because I occupied the whole resource. So this one tells you that if you, if you call, if you issue the MVT instruction, take about 2,000 cycles for the CPU itself to release the resource. And uh, if you call NanoNap, it's similar, and the actual overhead is just like uh, the uh, Linux kernel system overhead. And the few taxes take about way longer uh, because few taxes has to handle uh, other stuff. And also, uh, to enter the deep sleep, you have a requirement which that you call the few taxes, and then the OS schedule the uh, the OS schedule the uh, idle thread there and the idle thread call and wait. Right. Uh, here is we, how we uh, implement our scheduler. So we get no change to the latency critical thread because the signal we want from the latency critical thread is just like whether that call is busy or not. Remember that for each call, we divide to, we, do, we reserve one SMT thread for the latency critical workload, one thread for the uh, batch workload. And the batch workload, the, sorry, the, uh, the batch LAN, we call it LAN here, it's because sometimes the, 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 both, soft, both software and hardware use the name threads. The batch LAN just need to monitor whether the latency critical LAN is busy or not. If it's busy, I, I'm not going to run. If not busy, I run. Okay. So, we, so which means we do not no change the latency critical workload. Uh, but we instrument the batch workload uh, to detect uh, whether the latency critical is uh, latency uh, critical uh, hardware thread is in sleep, right? Uh, we do this is mainly because uh, our research lab is doing the uh, we doing compiler uh, research, so it's easy for us to just like come change the compiler to instrument the uh, trampoline there to monitor state. But in theory, this uh, idea is quite general, and you can. And just like you, your batch workload, actually, your batch workload can uh, do this checking every time you enter the kernel, or you can have another interrupt to change that. And that's going to make this approach more general, right? So some companies trying the idea in, inside their company. Uh, so and then we put them together and to the same uh, call, and the batch then going to be monitored the latency critical. Line. Right, and then here is what happened. Uh, so batch uh, thread is because uh, latency critical uh, length uh, idle, so the batch workload here. Well, it is working. It keep checking whether the latency critical length ready uh, is busy or not. So uh, this is like uh, uh, if it is a if it is idle, we just keep going. So what's fast fast, right? So if it is not right, if it is not idle, we're gonna be dive into the kernel, hold my breath, uh, uh, so hold my breath, and until the, you hope that the latency critical lane gonna be uh, becoming idle uh, again quite very quickly, right? So, and here here we go. So it's it identified. Okay, it's it's busy now. So I just call the nano app, and now you release all your resource back to the active uh, latency critical thread and keep going, and uh, so. Here that, uh, and now the third point that now the latency critical workload is finished. For example, this may be after a database transaction or after a search workload or after a browser that you finish, uh, 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 you finish this rendering uh, uh, frame, right? And that time it's gonna be called uh, sleep. So the OS know that uh, this uh, latency critical learn is going to be idle so at that point, uh, it's just like touch the flag of the uh, ba uh, touch the flag where the batch workload waiting on, right? After it touched the sorry, after it touched the flag, the batch will gonna be come back 
from the uh, Nettlenap. Okay, so here's what ha uh, here's our result for the, for the single call, and uh, uh, there's two SMT lens, and uh, the first one showed that what has happened we co-run together with all bunch of other uh, Java program together with Lucent, and you can see that the latency is not affected at all. So latency is pretty much same. Uh, because the, because when the latency critical workload is running and the batch workload uh, it does not uh, occupy any resource and the batch workload uh, also just like uh, does not uh, try to jump in and uh, uh, affect the performance of latency critical workload and the utilization is uh, the utilization used to be uh, quite low is because as we show in the first uh, page that because the nature of those workloads, everybody has to run their latency critical workload in a low utilization because they have to reserve the resource. And if they run too busy, their latency, their tail latency is gonna be increased exponentially. Right? That's why they never go to 100%. And now it's after they co-run together and uh, your core is gonna be always busy, right? So, and here's hap what happened if you have seven cores and uh, uh, same the uh, latency, uh, uh, the, uh, sorry, code again, co-running to co together with the batch workload and able to push your core always busy, right? And uh, not only you can do the like run, uh, uh, mutual exclusive one, but also because this gives you the power to control the interference. So you can some algorithms uh, to, uh, the, to, to check how much influence I can, how much effect I can uh, accept uh, if I co-run together for a while. So you can control after each, uh, so after uh, the latency critical work, uh, after the latency critical workload becoming active, you can decide, okay, how many, uh, how long I'm going to run there, and uh, th then you can give a budget, right? So this is gonna be, improve the utilization even further, and but this giving, um, but this also affects the performance a little bit. This just give you r very fun control about uh, how much overhead you can accept, right? So, and uh, now, based on this one, you can have a different, in the paper, it's gonna a bunch of different policies uh, to check how to uh, co-run together for a short period of time without uh, violate the latency requirement. Okay, so, and uh, here is that a bunch of different policies. And uh, the dynamic body policy is the most, uh, uh, you can call it, and the ones that are most, uh, a most aggressive approach, so you can push the utilization way further with that one, without violate the latency, right? Uh, so, and here's the conclusion. So what we uh, did in the paper is that we try to introduce a idea called pretty simple borrowing uh, uh, for the SMT and try to uh, make this simple optimization possible because, uh, all of the resources are just idle now in every data center, right? So any approach we can improve their utilization is gonna be save a huge number, a huge uh, energy for the whole planet. So I uh, hope those guys gonna be uh, push, uh, hope they're gonna, they're gonna read the paper and uh, implement this idea in the data center. Uh, yeah, so we got a, a do, do we still have a little bit of time? Yeah. So, and now it's, uh, but given that I have a little bit of time, now it's just like quickly explain what I'm now working on. So it's still extend the idea of the profiler. So now it's working on is that if you look at this uh, tail latency workload, normally they have a long tail. And long tail means that for the majority of the request, they just like, uh, their, uh, their latency is pretty low, but there are always a few percentage of requests is outliers they're gonna be on the right far wide. This is, this, a lot of workload follow the same distribution, right? And now the, our work is just like how to uh, figure out why uh, those long requests uh, 
why this, why this uh, we just figure out the reasons of those long requests and how can we automatically do a feedback driven optimization try to uh, stamp out these outlayers, right? This, which means that if, if we can make this work, our batch workload not only improve the utilization, but also at the same time try to help the whole system to, a, in, to just uh, uh, the batch workload at the same time try to help your latency critical workload to reduce your tail latency, right? By giving the knowledge you learned from the whole, uh, whole stack system, right? Cool. Yeah. So, and now this is, uh, and another one interesting in that if you look at those tail latency requests, and they are very hard to repeat. So, because those long requests uh, are generated by some noise in your system, right? And uh, for example, you may have a garbage collection happened in your GVM, and then your system stop, re stop receiving the request for like 100 milliseconds. And after 100 milliseconds, you open your socket, you find, okay, there are 100 requests waiting in my network socket uh, to be processed, right? And uh, all the other, for example, if you have interrupt to that call, and you have, uh, uh, you have interrupt to that call, and, uh, but you have to wait for the software IRQ thread to handle that interrupt, uh, to, to handle the event. But the software IRQ thread may be preempted by other threads. Right, and then, um, so there's a, like a delay inside kernel and that decided by a lot of runtime um, parameters, which mean that you cannot predict them. What you have to do is that uh, your system pretty much have to run same as a helicopter or any uh, aircraft controller where you have to continuous monitor uh, what is happening in your system and you have to predict that what is happening and try to take actions. Uh, this is uh, what I'm working on. Hope this next uh, year I can share uh, some result here. Okay. Yep. Uh, any questions? Discussions? Yep. How does? I know. Sorry. Good. Here we go. How does this approach of uh, just swapping between lanes compare with just having the batch process at a lower priority so it preempts and not using the SMT at all? No, that's that's low priority. That's that's the the low the low priority approach does not work. Is because you can give the low priority, uh, but the kernel, but because the whole lane is idle. I mean, okay. I think I guess your question is what happens if you put them the same SMT thread? Yeah. Okay. There. Yeah. The 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 first approach is 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 what you mentioned that. Uh, I do, uh, people do not reserve uh, to batch or reserve active, right? You run them together at the same time. And uh, some threads are, uh, uh, some threads are latency critical, they have higher priority. And some of them has lower priority. And, uh, and that's one, and that approach does not work well, it's because it's very hard to control the interference from the lower priority now on the latency kernel. So the lower priority does not mean that you never jump in to the system when the uh, latency critical job is running, right? Uh, yeah, and there's one approach that you can give the latency critical workload real-time priority. That can be help you a lot. But the problem is that for a lot of, comp for the, I think for some RTOS workload, that's possible, but for those workload, doesn't a workload, you do not want to give the whole Docker instance a real-time um, priority, right? That's gonna be a, introduce more trouble that your uh, network may not be response anymore, right? Um, the sort of traditional approach in Linux to this sort of thing has been using CPU affinity to sort of tie tasks to a yeah. particular CPU, and I've, I've never looked at the CPU and Affinity actually works within the, um, you know, multiple threads in one core. Uh, how does this relate to that approach of just using CPU Affinity to tie batch tasks you can, into you, a core? Yeah, you can, you can, uh, the, the current, I think the current approach, current data center approach is that you give a CPU Affinity 
for you give a okay you give a CPU affinity for the active work uh, sorry you give a CPU affinity for the active workload to a set of core and same time you give a CPU affinity to the a batch workload on another core but when they do this they still turn off the SMT right because if you turn on the SMT and each SMT thread uh, from the OS perspective is just same as one core right so if you set affinity of latency critical workload on one SMT set batch on another SMT core but on the same core they're going to be keep running together right so when they active together you cannot control the interference from the batch workload right so if you that approach only works if you split them to the separate core right uh, you sort of touched on it very briefly um, what about like cache pollution by the that's a good question so uh, cache uh, so when the batch workload is running batch workload may trash the cache right. or whatever cache so why is it working well for our workload? I that, think that was really my question was how come your benchmarks don't show this problem? Yes. Yeah. So uh, this is one interesting observation and uh, all that you can call it insight here that's interesting. For a lot of workloads like uh, Lucent or some database stuff, their, their, Linton, their locality is the inside transaction, which means that when they began the transaction, there's no locality, right? When the, when, when the transaction starts, there's a very strong locality that uh, until you finish your, that transaction. So what, here we carefully, that's why we see that the batch workload should not jump in the middle, right? If you jump in the middle, you're going to be trash the catch and again, a huge effect uh, on the uh, latency critical workload. But if, you, if your batch workload starts to run after the latency critical finish that transaction, it's okay because the data in the catch brought by the latency critical work is garbage anyway, right? So you can trash them out. And, uh, and now we even see the performance improvement uh, from our workload. Uh, that means that uh, some, uh, but the, it's not really to this one, but the performance improve, improvement will say is that because our batch work keep the core busy, so the core won't go to the deep sleep state. Right. Uh, otherwise, if, if there's no batch workload, the whole core gonna go to deep sleep state. And when the next transaction coming, you have the whole core has to wake up from that's that wake up gonna take a very uh, I forgot the exact number, but that wake up takes so long time. Right. So, but if the latency critical workload is not those workload, for example, maybe I don't know others, maybe some HPC computation, or if there's a strong correlation between the transactions, the batch gonna be have a way higher impact on the locality of the latency critical workload. Yeah. Do we have any other questions? Couple of minutes. Just a couple of minutes. Um, I was just wondering, similar to what the other other guys asked, if you use the CPU with SMT disabled, and then you added, say, an extra IPC mechanism to say um, to your batch workload, just yield the core as you would without using NanoNAP. Um, do you see similar performance improvements, or yeah, if if you, you can, if you can, uh, oh. if if you can make sure that the OS won't schedule another batch workload uh, there, then you can see similar. You can get similar perform similar utilization, similar performance. Yeah, yeah. But the the problem is that you cannot. Uh, it's very hard to control. Uh, for the it's very hard to control for kernel. Then your system is a uh, quite busy. For example, you get a bunch of Docker instance, a bunch of server running together. Right. This is a. I think in more general, this is an interesting question that as your system becoming more complex and. Uh, those a lot of OS policy is just designed for a very simple scenario like real time priority stuff. Where it designed, for, yeah, designed for uh, people where they know their application very well. But for a lot of these data center, the the guy who run your program or, for example, your browser, you when you run your browser, you do not know how many threads is created and how what kind of resource you're going to use, right? 
around through lunchtime the rest of the day, I yeah. take it? Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much, everybody. And we've got a little wee something here from the good people who have yeah. run this conference to say thank you for all your time and effort. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah.